How's it going, everybody? Uh, we are now getting into our fifth week of the course, and this is when we are moving on to our next unit. So we've had narrative, we've had description, uh, and now we're moving on to argument and persuasion. Really, it's kind of the core of the course. Uh, the course is titled Rhetoric and Composition. Rhetoric means uh, a, a mode of argumentation or a mode of uh, attempting to persuade your audience, your listener, your reader. Um, so rhetoric really is the art of uh, speaking and writing convincingly, of arguing and doing it well. Uh, that word sometimes gets bandied about with negative connotations. You'll maybe see on the news or some program on television or YouTube or some commentator will often say, oh, that person, they just spew a bunch of rhetoric, meaning a, a bunch of hot air. Um, but in its proper sense, rhetoric means skillful, you know, artfully done argumentation. So it shouldn't be a bunch of hot air, as it were. Um, so the the whole point of chapter 14 uh, is to get you all in gear uh, to uh, in, in an effort to get you to understand argument uh, what constitutes a good argument um, what constitutes a bad argument um, you're going to hear three terms and you probably heard them already maybe in high school or elementary school the three classical appeals when it comes to argumentation. And the Greek philosopher Aristotle, uh, it is said that he coined these. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos meaning you're arguing based on uh, character, authority, credibility, shared values. Okay, so if I make an, an argument based on ethos, I might begin it in such a way. As... Americans, we believe, or as Saints fans, we cheer in such and such a way. So ethos, I'm appealing to a shared sense of value, of uh, community maybe. Ethos also means character, credibility, authority, as in who are you to speak on the issue? So as a teacher, an English teacher at that, uh, I am qualified to discuss with you all matters of writing, technical aspects of writing, content aspects of writing, uh, sentence structure, grammar, all that good stuff. Um, so that's ethos. It's kind of a ethos is a wide ranging one. It covers a lot of ground. So credibility, character, authority, shared values, uh, logos, logos, and you could see the the root uh, relationship with these words, these Greek words and English words that we use today. Ethos, ethics, logos, logic. So logic, um, logical argument. So usually we boil that down to facts, objective data. Uh, that's logos at its most pure, bare form. Uh, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the graph. Let's look at statistics, for example. Uh, our, uh, numbers are inarguable. Um, uh, they, they don't relate to feelings. They just are. Uh, we could do a, a crime report or a college admissions report, and it'll say people of demographic X did this, people of demographic Y did that. And you can't argue with the numbers. It is what it is. Now, how we got to those numbers, were the numbers tampered with? Um, are the, are the uh, methods of gathering the data, uh, are, are they faulty, perhaps? We can consider those. But uh, generally speaking, numbers are numbers. We know this. So logic. But it doesn't just have to do with numbers, raw data. It, it, it's also um, sensible construction. Um, so how you logically uh, sequence your argument, perhaps. You might do it on a first, I have this point to make. Second, I have this point to make. In fact, when you're reading uh, the Declaration of Independence section, Thomas Jefferson, you will see him enumerate, number, 
uh, his grievances uh, with King George III and his government, the, the monarchy in England, you will see him lay out in a logical, coherent way X, Y, and Z, 1, 2, 3, etc. So logic, logos, uh, can cover some ground too, like ethos. It's not just numbers, uh, although that is it at its most sort of rudimentary uh, form. Uh, pathos, this has to do with feelings, okay? If you call someone pathetic, uh, that's usually meant in a pejorative way, meaning that that person is kind of in a sad state of affairs. Uh, they can't get their house in order, as it were. They're pathetic. They're sad. They're weak, maybe. Okay, we've all been called pathetic. I certainly have. Um, uh, but pathos, uh, it, words like sympathy, empathy, there's that root, P-A-T-H, okay, in the middle of those words there. Uh, so sympathy is understanding another person's plight um, because we're all human beings. Empathy is typically described as putting yourself in that person's shoes, maybe because you've experienced the same thing before. Um, we kind of use those words sympathy and empathy interchangeably, but uh, there are some differences there. So feelings, pathos having to do with feelings. So if I give you an account of, say, a starving puppy on the side of the road. I don't need to give you any facts. I mean, maybe some facts. I was driving along Highway 16. Facts about the setting. Maybe that's important. But I don't have to give you any, like, data of, you know, what kind of breed this dog is, perhaps. I don't have to give you uh, any kind of a, an ethical bent to it. I could just say starving dog on the side of the road. Now, when I say that, I'm pretty confident that most of you are probably saying, oh, no, or aw. We care about animals. We care about people, too. We should. If we see somebody hurting, we want to care for that person or dog or cat. Um, our heart strings are being tugged. I always use the classic example of that commercial with Sarah McLaughlin singing in the background. Uh, I will remember you. Will you remember me? No, I'm not going to sing it. Count your lucky stars. Okay. Uh, we see those sad faces of those dogs, and we want to go out and adopt a dog. We've been persuaded by feelings. Um, I think, personally, this is just my personal two cents, I think out of the three, ethos, using shared values and character, logos, using logic, data, statistics, uh, facts, objective reality, and pathos, using feelings. Out of those three, I think pathos is the most potent, the most powerful. Now, that doesn't mean it's the, the most moral or the most correct. We could debate that. But think of how many times you've been in an argument with somebody or you're trying to make your case, or somebody's making a case to you, and they put it, they just lard it with feelings, okay? Like, think of all the blank. Think of all the suffering people in Haiti, let's say, okay? If you're called to feel bad for someone or to care for someone, how are you going to argue with that? Or, what are you, a monster if you don't care for X, Y, and Z person. So, and again, this is just my personal opinion. I think people use uh, emotion to, uh, uh, to manipulate. I, I mean, persuasion and argument is, by definition, manipulating us. We are being manipulated to see the world in terms of how the arguer or persuader is trying to present the world for us. But I think the thing that really goes for the gut check is using emotion, okay? And I think as a society, again, this is just me opining here, uh, I think we're getting a little carried away with ourselves using emotion uh, in all of our arguments. Um, you guys can maybe infer what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't want to get terribly controversial here, but we know that people use feelings, okay? And you can't argue with feelings, all right? Um, 
So each of these three, ethos, pathos, and logos, are tremendously powerful. Uh, and they, 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 they are modes through which you get your point across and compel your listener, your reader, to side with you. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. I mean, when you read the two pieces this week, when you read Letter from Birmingham Jail by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, see how they're, of course, you have your questions to answer in the uh, announcement for this week, but just in the back of your mind, think, when are they using logical appeals, ethical appeals, emotional appeals, okay? When are... Are they appropriate? Is each one of those appeals appropriate in, say, every case that they're using them? Perhaps, perhaps not. And again, uh, emotion isn't... There are times when we, uh, we're human beings. We're not robots. We are emotional. There's no dispensing with emotion. And there are appropriate ways to use emotion. There are appropriate times to use emotion. So I, I certainly don't want to give you the, uh, the impression that emotion is just should be dismissed outright when you see it in an argument. Um, it certainly has its place. Um, I, I just think, again, to get back to what I was talking about earlier, that we're kind of overusing it, and we're kind of straying away from more of the factual, uh, value-based uh, arguments uh, in, in public discourse today, uh, in politics, and all sorts of realms. Uh, so think about that and go and check out the blog. The blog for the week has to do with that too. Um, asking you all to think about, are we arguing with each other too much as a, an American society? Or maybe is it we're not arguing with each other the right way? There's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. You guys can think of all sorts of examples, I'm sure. So uh, check out the blog this week and uh, give some feedback on that. I poked into the blog last week. I replied to uh, a couple of you. I am monitoring the blog, so please contribute. I think what I'm going to do with the blog, instead of grading it, uh, I said that I might start grading it at some point. I think what I'm going to do is, those of you who participate regularly in the blog each week, you guys are going to get a little extra, say, some kind of a bonus. Uh, I don't know if it's something I will add to your final grade or maybe a large assignment, uh, whatever it is, but incentive for you guys to keep blogging. Um, the next two papers we're going to write, uh, one is the argument that has no research attached to it. That's going to be due not this week, but the following week. So you want to think about what you want to argue for. And again, uh, I, I don't want it to be something we've heard a thousand times, like, you know, legalize marijuana or uh, meat is murder or um, the earth is flat or something like that. I don't want any of those things. Try to be creative. Think about something. Maybe you want to make a proposal, uh, some kind of call to action, something like that. Anyway, the first version is going to be a no research required version. And then the next version, it's going to be the capstone of our 1101 half uh, is going to be a research required version. So I'm going to go over that with you guys probably next week's video talking about uh, where to go to get some valuable, uh, credible research uh, and how to incorporate it in your paper. Uh, but for this week, all you need to do this week is read the Martin Luther King uh, piece, Letter from Birmingham Jail, read the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, answer the questions that I have on the announcement, uh, and participate in the blog. And of course, read uh, chapter 14 and read it carefully. Again, this is like, this section is the touchstone of 1101. So we, we, we've been arriving to this point, okay? Uh, so I've got your descriptives in uh, uh, as of Sunday night. This is being uh, filmed uh, Sunday afternoon. It's about 1, 1.30 uh, Sunday right now. Um, so I will get those back to you within two weeks. Uh, and uh, all your grades are back as of now, guys. So uh, there shouldn't be anything floating around uh, as of you all seeing this video. Okay, well, let's have a fun uh, Super Bowl. I, where I, I hope you guys had a fun time watching the Super Bowl. Uh, I don't care about either team for what it's worth, uh, but we'll see. Anywho, Mr. Volpe saying over and out. You guys have a great week. Get in touch with me, Miss Evans, with any questions. Bye-bye.